your host, Bashar, and we have a great episode of Truth and Lies, where we examine the truth and expose the lies. I want to just let everyone know we are live on Facebook and all three of our satellites, North American, Australian, and the Middle East. So comment, share, and like. You can find us on our Facebook, our YouTube, or trinitychannel.com to watch all of our great episodes of Truth and Lies. We have a wonderful topic for today, but I just want to let all the viewers know we are taking calls and questions, but not until after 30 minutes has expired so that we can get the topic going. The number you can reach us at is 248-416-1300. Like I said, we have a great topic today. It is about the infamous satanic verses. Are they true or false? So we'll be getting right into that. So we have a great guest with us in studio and... We have a wonderful Skype guest as well. Let us introduce each one of them. First is Brother Ismail. How you doing, Brother Ismail? Fine, Brother ba Bashar. Thank you for having me on the show. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Brother Ismail is a bond servant of the Lord Jesus. Ismail Nimr is currently doing weekly shows for the Arabic TV programming on ABN, and also, uh, also on You Ask and the Bible Answers. Ismail is very involved in the community and allows the Lord to use him as a tool to evangelize, teach, and preach the Word of God in both Arabic and English languages to as many Muslims and Christians as he can. He is the host of Christian Arabic show on ABN called You Ask the Bible Answers, which is a great show, recommended as well, and also prepares and records Arabic Christian discipleship programs addressing new converts. So we're definitely very happy to have you, Brother Ismail. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Also, always with me in studio is Brother Eddie. Welcome, Brother Eddie. Brother Eddie uh, teaches at local churches. Uh, in the metro Detroit area, obviously he does a lot of door-to-door -door ministry down in Dearborn, which is awesome. And uh, he just talks to Muslims, and, but he's also comfortable talking with atheists, cr other Christians, anyone that really needs to hear the message of the gospel. And uh, he's a wonderful brother, and we're always happy to have him with us. Well, brother thank you for having me. I appreciate it being here. Amen, brother. Amen. And we have a brother with us over Skype, brother Nadir Ahmed. Uh, welcome, brother Nadir. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you introduce yourself to the, uh, to the viewers and let them know what you do, brother. Sure. Um, I'm basically a Muslim apologist. I've had many debates with other Christian apologists on topics related to Islam. Um, you could probably Google my name and, um, and you can find and see some of my debates. So I've been researching the claims of Islam and Christianity for about the last 20 years, and uh, that's about it. Well, like I said, we're glad to have you, and we're glad to get straight into it. So we're going to be talking about the satanic verses, uh, true or false. And uh, yeah, so let's get straight to it. Uh, Brother Eddie, uh, we've heard about the satanic verses. Mm -hmm. And oh, actually, I do want to let the viewers know um, we are having a discussion panel. This is not a technical debate. We're going to have, you know, as most formats, we're just going to be talking each giving enough time to all the uh, speakers to make sure we get the topic fully uh, fleshed out. So let's get straight to it, Brother Eddie. Um, uh, what about the satanic verses draws people in? Is it is it a myth or is it true? Is it something we made up? Well, when looking at the Islamic sources in particular, uh, we find out that this story actually did take place. Uh, and it's infamous for being called the Satanic Verses, and it's really brought about by uh, Suleiman Rashid. If you guys want to look him up, he made a. Uh, I'm sorry. Rushdie. Uh, Suleiman Rushdie, and he brought about uh, a book, a novel, and uh, that became famous. But what are these Satanic Verses, and where can we find them in the Quran? Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at the Islamic sources, so that way no one can accuse us Christians of mentioning something that's not Islamic. And I recommend you as watchers, any Muslims, to do the same thing. But before we even start, in chapter 53, verses 1 through 5, I'm just going to read along to see whether or not Muhammad can actually make an error. By the star when it descends, this is Allah talking, God, your companion Muhammad has not strayed nor has erred, nor does he speak from within his own inclination. It is not but a revelation revealed taught to him by one in tens and in strength. So obviously, Muhammad here is receiving uh, some, something taught by Allah himself. And what, were, what was taught in chapter 53, verse 19 through 23? 
Uh, I'm just going to read along in chapter 53, verses 19 through 23. These are the pagan goddesses who are exalted. Muhammad here exalts them and remembers them. Uh, also, we're going to mention some hadiths that he prostrates himself to these pagan goddesses, pleasing the pagans that were there. Then when the Muslims uh, see that or hear that, they get mad at him for doing so. After that, he says, it's not my fault. It's Satan's fault. He has cast this upon my tongue. He puts it in the Quran, and he doesn't even say that he's sorry or anything of that nature. He just says that this is not my fault. This is Shaitan's fault. So have you considered Allah, Al-Uzza, and Minat, the third and the other one? Is the male for you and for him the female? That then is an unjust division. So who are they exactly? As we mentioned earlier, which we're going to get into, we're going to get into somewhat deeper. Uh, they are female deities, Lat, Uzza, and Minat, who were the daughters of the supreme pagan god in pagan Arabia, uh, called Allah, which is a rock god, and the pagan Kaaba, by the way, because uh, prior to the Muslim era, the Kaaba was pagan. Uh, and until this day, Alat and Uzza and Minat are, are very important because you would see the crescent, the star that's on many Muslim flags surrounded by a moon or there's a moon right next to it. So the Lat is the star, Uzza is a, 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 I'm sorry, a, the crescent, the moon, that's Lat. The star is Uzza, which is Venus, because they're, they're on like a lot of mosques and a lot of flags. And uh, Minat means fate. So these originally had uh, brought down a revelation to Muhammad, but then Muhammad can't tell the difference whether this is fantasy or reality. He can't tell the difference whether this was God or Satan. So our question is, if Muhammad can't tell whether this was Satan or God, how can we tell if, uh, if Jibra'il was actually true or false, whether this was fantasy or reality. And then, like I said, we're going to get into some, uh, if this was fiction, we're going to get into some of uh, the hadiths narrated by Ibn Abbas and their Sahih hadiths and history of Al-Tabri mentioning these verses, and then some of the verses were taken away out of the Quran. So we'll start off with that. Awesome. Thank you, Brother Eddie. And yes, I've, uh, I've heard briefly about Salman Rushdie, and I know he had a fatwa on him for making that book. So it is something that wasn't, um, wasn't very comfortable to deal with, especially with the Islamic world. So I want to pose a question to you, uh, Brother Nadir. Uh, what do you make of the satanic verses? Is it something of legend, or is it something that we can find in the Quran or the Hadith? Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, the, the vast majority, actually, is unanimous. They believe that the Satanic verses is actually a fabrication. It does not have an isnad. But I myself, I actually don't care because the story proves nothing. Um, am I able to uh, share my desktop here? In fact, I'll share my desktop in just a second here. But let me just quickly uh, go over what this, what, um, what the Satanic verses are. So, but actually, let me do this. Let me first correct. Um, uh, the person who was it Eddie who was speaking before? I I, I think so. Yeah. So he said that somehow the um, that Muhammad prostrated uh, to these idols, and he said that this was uh, put in the Quran. No, it was never put in the Quran. Uh, it was never written down or anything like that. He said that the crescent star. This is represents Lot. This is also another fabrication. He says the stars represent Uzza. You know, because you got the moon and star sign of Islam. This has nothing to do with Islam. Actually, this came hundreds of years after Islam. And then he said that Prophet Muhammad could not tell the difference between fantasy and reality. That's another fabrication. The story never says anything about that. This is found in Ibn Ishaq. So, like I said, I don't really care if it's true or not. It proves nothing. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop, if I may, um, because what's amazing about this is the, the best defense which I found for this is actually comes from the Bible. And I guess you guys can all see my desktop over here. Now, what's inside Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, it prophesies Muhammad as a true prophet, and there can be nobody else other than him. Now, I don't want to open up that can of worms here. I know that's going to be a, a big discussion. So let's just say this. Let's agree to disagree. I'm sure the panel will disagree with me, but this is our view. And I hope 
you guys, we can do that discussion maybe in a month from now. Is Muhammad the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18? But what's interesting is not only does it prophesize about Muhammad, but it defends Muhammad. Look what it says over here inside Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. It said, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, the word here I want everyone to look at is a word presume. Well, that's just an English word. The word in the Hebrew is zud, and in Arabic, you got zuhud. So what the word means is by intention, that you really intended to do this. But when we look at the story of the so-called satanic verses, Muhammad had no intention of doing this. This was nothing more than a sa satanic hoodwinkle, which was he completely didn't even know. So when they said he prostrated before them, it was done without intention. So in recap, not only does Deuteronomy 18.18 18 prove, prophesize about Muhammad uh, being that true prophet, but it also defends Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from the story of the satanic verse. And that's why I say I don't, it proves nothing because Muhammad never had the intention to do these things. And the story ends by God consoling Muhammad. He says it's not true. It was actually God who, who consoled him and said, and did not ask for repentance, reprimand, or anything like that, because that was never his intention. But the moral of the story is simply this, and it's, and it's found inside chapter 22, verse 53 of the Quran. It's very important. It says, God is basically throws out what Satan throws in. So Satan has his uh, satanic revelations, but God protects the Quran, God protects Muhammad, and, um, and, and, and basically, in fact, I got the verse right over here, let me just read it for you. But Allah abolishes what Allah throws in. That's chapter 22, verse 52 of the Quran. Now, why is that important? Because the satanic verses exist in the Bible. But Allah did not protect the Bible. But Allah protects the Quran and the Hadith from satanic verses. And I will be producing overwhelming evidence for me for you tonight, showing you satanic verses in the Bible. I will also show you uh, where Jesus Himself comes under the control of Satan. So let's do this. Let's look at the satanic verses and what they really prove of Islam. And let's look at the satanic verses of biblical Christianity. And let's see where that leads us. So I think that's my three minutes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get back to those. I'm very interested to hear about that, uh, Brother Nadir. But uh, let's get to Brother Ismail. Uh, what do you say in regards to what Brother Nadir just said? as far as there being satanic verses in the Bible, or, I mean, to me, if Muhammad got any re revelation from Satan and he spoke presumptuously, or let's say without intention, he got hoodwinked, as Brother Nadir is saying, doesn't that put in question the Quran in totality? If, if he couldn't differentiate between what is Gabriel and who is Shaitan or True. Iblis, doesn't that put in question the Quran in its entirety? True. Um, first, um, I would like to, again, uh, say hello to... Uh, uh, Mr. Nadir and to all the uh, viewers and Mr. Nadir, uh, you know, he's uh, following the same strategy as uh, most Muslim um, apologists, apolog apologists they do when we give them something like Brother Eddie was giving him something then they go back to the Bible Right. you know, so we're, we're talking about sat satanic, ver satanic verses in the Quran then he goes back to tell us that there are satanic verses in the Bible, and I would like to see those, hear those. Yeah. Uh, as to uh, Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 20, uh, it's very sad, you know, that uh, my dear uh, brothers who are Muslims, they tell us that the Bible is corrupt, yeah. and then they go back to the same bi Bible that they say is corrupt, and they say, well, look, it, it proves that uh, the, the prophecy of our prophet Muhammad. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it defeats the, uh, the purpose. Uh, if you don't believe that this is from God, then why do you turn to it to prove the prophecy of your Muhammad? Okay, mm -hmm. this, is, this is one point. Um, as to uh, the claim that this speaks of Muhammad, it's been uh, uh, defeated over and over. Just one verse in John 5.39, the Lord Jesus is turning to the Jews 
that they know their Torah and their Psalms and prophets better than you and I. And he said, search the scriptures that you think you have eternal life, and all of it points to me. Mm -hmm. All of it. And when the Lord Jesus in Matthew 16 and, and elsewhere, he asked, who do people say that I am the Son of Man? They all said either John the Baptist, Jeremiah, um, Elias, or one of the prophets, or the prophet. They were referring to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Mm -hmm. And then here came Peter in Acts 3 to, to tell us exactly who that prophet was. In, in Acts 3, uh, 22, when he was addressing the Jews, um, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed... All the families of the earth shall be blessed to you first. God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So Peter was applying that prophecy was fulfilled, and it was the Lord Jesus who was that promised prophet who would to come, uh, and God would raise for his people so they can hear to him. And this was one aspect of the Lord Jesus in his humanity. He was the prophet. And in his divinity, he was the God of the prophets, according to uh, Revelation 22. Thank you, Brother Ismail. Uh, that is very, very key as to what, uh, why we defend Jesus and, you know, why, why Jesus is the revelation of the Old Testament. But... Uh, Back to you, Eddie. Uh, let's let's take for example. Let's give Nadir credit and just say, okay, maybe al at al uzamanat. We maybe got that wrong, which I don't believe so. But let's just say, let's give him that we got that wrong. What what is the consequence of having Satan influence the greatest prophet, according to Islam, to have walked this earth, where no other prophet before him? Was ever was ever able to be mixed with Satan, you know, Satan, Satan's influence, and yet the greatest prophet that's going to walk this earth is being influenced by him. So the, I ask also the same question to you: What does that, what does that consequence affect the view of the Quran? Right. So uh, that affects a lot because by him having uh, Satan interjection, Satan's interjection into the Quran, how can we trust it? And uh, uh, Brother Nadir said, uh, this, is, this is a fabrication. Well, I don't think so. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 2, book 19, number 177. In relation to that verse, to those verses that I just mentioned, uh, 53, chap uh, chapter 53, verse 19 through 23. The Prophet and I prostrated while reciting in Najm with him, prostrated the Muslims, the pagans, the jinns, and all human beings. Um, Narrated Abdullah, the first surah in which prostration was mentioned was Surah Al-Najm, the star. Allah's apostle prostrated while reciting it. And everybody behind him prostrated, except for a man who's full of dust, and he did not prostrate on it. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6, book 60, number 386. And in case you're going to say this was a complete fabrication, brother, who do I trust, you or Ibn Kathir, your most trusted scholar? Do you define Islam or the first, uh, uh, the, the first century right after, uh, th that means 6th or 7th century, right after Muhammad? Who do I trust? How about your scholar Ibn Kathir? In case, I, I knew that a lot of Muslims will mention that this is a fabrication. So let's read what Ibn Kathir said, and I'll mention the source as well. Many commentators mention here the story of Al-Gharaniq, the three daughters of Allah, by the way. And it became known to the point that many Muslims who went to Ethiopia came back for they thought the pagans converted to Islam. And that story from Ibn Hatim, narrated from Ibn Yunus, from Ibn Habib, told from the apostle of Allah that when he recited the chapter of Al-Najm in Mecca, he, the shaitan that is, cast it into his mouth. Shaitan has that much power over the seal of all prophets to cast something into his mouth? And you want me to trust someone like that? 
But the uh, passage goes on. He cast it into his mouth. Have you considered, this is in quotation, have you considered the goddesses Allah, the Uzza, and Minat, the third and the other? In the Quran, chapter 53, verse 19 through 20. For sure their intercession is to hope for. And then the prophet did bow down, and the, pagan did not, and the pagans piled down with him. Who am I going to trust here? I'm going to your sources. You're telling me, no, it's not true, it's fabricated. Ibn Kathir, scholarly, person, Sunni, does believe in what, what happened in the Quran and the hadith as well. So if you're going to say that it's not true, you'll have to give a disclaimer for the hadith. You have to say, no, the hadith is not true. Sahih al-Bukhari is not true. What are you going to just cherry pick here? But like you said earlier, it's not a debate. We're not trying to debate, but it may go there. You're, we're mentioning something, you're going into the Qur'an, it may go there. And, and we're doing it with love and respect, brother. So I don't want you to get offended if it does go there. Okay. Uh, brother Nadir, um, so what Brother Eddie's uh, trying to get to, so, you know, we want to go to the original sources like Ibn Kathir and Bukhari, but uh, the question remains, uh, just like you said, if it was just a hoodwink, why does that not put into question Muhammad's prophethood and um, I know you said you want to mention some of the satanic verses that allegedly in the Bible. So whatever, uh, along those topics, what did you want to talk about? Sure. Well, let me, let me ask real quick. Uh, what's the time limit here? I think we're going over the three to five minutes, I think. I just want to know. So I... No, no, I don't no, no we're, we're, yeah, we're trying to keep everyone within the limit. So... Okay, so um, let me go ahead and take five minutes to answer yeah, all of that. Okay, so let me first respond to some of the points. It's not that Muhammad got hoodwinkled because when we read the story, it appears he didn't even know what was going on. But the people behind him got hoodwinkled. But as I said, the Bible in, eight, in Deuteronomy 18, 20, chapter 18, verse 20, it has already made it clear. It's a prophet that speaks with zud, with intention. And that was his intention to do that. That prophet should be punished. But when we see here, Muhammad had no intention of doing this. In fact, when he, the, God did not even reprimand him. He didn't even ask, oh, well, Muhammad, repent. He didn't even do that because he had no intention of doing this. Um, you asked a question about why do we point out satanic verses in the Bible, but then again, we also prove that Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible. See, that's a question for your pastor because if you look, if you go to many churches today, they teach the same thing, that the Bible has been corrupted. People like J. Smith, I'm sure you're all familiar with J. Smith. He's one of your guys as Christian scholars. Um, he has come out and admitted the Bible has been corrupted. And in fact, when I went to the church down the street from my house uh, in Peoria, Illinois, he said, hey, listen, we're not fundies over here. If you want to come with that, the Bible's all God's word and never been changed. We don't preach that over here. So please take this question to your pastor. Educated people don't speak like that anymore. The educated people, especially in biblical scholarship, almost all agree the Bible has been changed and it has been corrupted. But that's not the topic of tonight's debate. Um, regarding Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, like I said, we will discuss that at a later time. Would you like to discuss that, uh, Brother Ishmael and Eddie? Can we do that sometime? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whenever you'd like, okay, maybe great. we'll have you on future shows. But we'd like to stick okay. with the topic if, if that's okay, Nadia. Yes, yes. Let's do that later. So that, we got a firm commitment for the guys. Okay, so the issue about, um, you know, you said that the, the hadith which you're quoting, that they, they um, bowed down to Surah Najm. That is a chapter in the Quran. I don't think that has anything to do with what we're talking about. But I told you, I don't care if it's fabricated or not. I actually like the story. Let's, for tonight's discussion, deal with it as an authentic story. Because like I told you, it is a ridiculous point. It, because Muhammad never had any intention to do these things, it never made its way in the Quran, as you falsely stated again, uh, the whole story goes nowhere. So you ask, well, why should we trust a man like Muhammad if something like this could happen? Well, I think you need to look at the satanic verses of Christianity. So I'm going to share my desktop again, and let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8. And it said, And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Wait a second. Let me make something clear. It is not possible for the devil to take God anywhere unless he goes willingly. The second the devil lays his hands on Jesus, there would be a huge fight to the death. Uh, at least if Satan tried to grab me, I'd fight him to death. Or, and Jesus would have been sacrificed for your sins right there and then. 
if he were to lose that epic battle. But that's not what happened. We see here that Satan took control of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Now remember, God told, God told Jesus to go to the desert to be tempted. That's, that's fine. But who told Jesus to get out of the desert? Satan did. And how is it that the devil took him? So here we see that Jesus fell under the power of Satan. And this, of course, is a huge sin because if Jesus is really God, then that means he went with Satan willingly to that mountain and then he showed him all the kingdom of the world. So this obviously, the satanic verses of Christianity debunk Christianity as a myth. But the so-called satanic verses of the Islam doesn't do anything. It just raises some questions like, okay, well, what about this and what about that? That's it. So how am I doing on time? Um, I think, uh, what was that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll have to keep my own time over. So, so I would like to know, because I want to give Eddie an opportunity to address Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Now, it's very important to understand the, the significance of the satanic verses. Satan has his verses. And th when I talked about the satanic, verse, satanic verses in the Bible, this is not what I'm talking about. This is just an appetizer. What's coming soon are real satanic verses, verses which you can, uh, you can uh, acknowledge and the whole humanity can acknowledge, wow, this can only be from Satan. So don't think it's only my uh, opinion which I'm trying to impose upon everybody. But like I said, the, the main course is coming later. So I want Eddie and I think Ishmael uh, to go ahead and please respond and explain to me how the devil took God. Did he go willingly or unwillingly? The mic is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Brother Nadir. I am, we are very glad that you brought up Matthew chapter 4. It is a, a great chapter, and I think if you just read a little bit further, I think you would know how Jesus responded and where the devil couldn't even tempt Jesus. But um, I'll let Ismail answer that. I just want to let the viewers know. Uh, we want to just uh, keep the conversation going, so I'll let you know in by maybe 10 or 15 minutes when we're going to open the phone lines up. This is really getting uh, heated, so I really want this to keep going before we take any questions or uh, comments. So please, Brother Ismail. Uh, before I uh, answer uh, Nadir's uh, false accusations to uh, the Lord Jesus being uh, taken uh, forcefully or by the power of Satan and calling these satanic verses. Uh, that's very ridiculous. I'm sorry to say this. I've never heard this before. Uh, but uh, I would like to say one thing. I, what, what makes me so proud of the God that I worship that is revealed in the person of Christ in the Bible is that he does not compromise his truth, neither his character, to uh, recruit followers. Uh, he does not go and tell uh, the Hindus, you know, by the way, your gods are acceptable and their uh, intercessory is acceptable, so let's join together and let's worship together. He does not do that. Uh, the Lord Jesus, when he came here, as a matter of fact, he did not make it very easy for people to follow him. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, narrow is the gate and uh, the, the, the road is very difficult and few those who find it. And uh, he said, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself every day. You've got to carry your cross and follow me daily. As to uh, uh, the churches that uh, uh, Mr. Nadir is saying, that they are admitting that the Bible has been corrupted, um, if there are such, uh, first I would say they, they would be a cult. They will not be a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they will not be of the orthodox of the Christian faith. Uh, all the Christians with all the, our different denominations, we believe that this is the infallible word of God. Uh, and uh, just I want to share just what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And I want to leave it there. This is the word of God. If God gave it, he is responsible to keep it. And if you tell me that this has been changed and altered, you're telling me you're accusing God that he could not keep his word. And men were greater and more powerful than God. So we'll leave it there. I want to go to Matthew 4, 8. 
Uh, like you said, Brother Bashar, sadly, uh, he did not read down, down the text, you know, to find out what happened. When the Lord Jesus, he rebuked him. He said, uh, uh, get away, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him. He was defeated. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. And here, the Lord Jesus, when he humbled himself, when he emptied himself, he hid his glory in the veil of his humanity. He came taking the form of a bond servant. Why did he come? He come so he can become a man, so he can uh, pay for our sins and do the work of the redemption. And part of that, just like Adam was defeated by Satan in the garden, here, the Lord Jesus, the last Adam, he came to defeat Satan as a man, and he did that victoriously and triumphantly when he allowed himself to be taken by the devil as a man and to be tempted for 40 days, and he succeeded and he became vict was victorious over Satan in those three times when he tempted him, and he was always referring, it is written, it is written, and it is written also, and he defeated Satan by the written word. The living word, the Lord Jesus, used the written word, the Bible, to defeat the enemy of the word. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ismail. We definitely appreciate that. Um, Brother Eddie, uh, I know you happen to know Jay a little bit more. So would Jay first say something as uh, ludicrous as the Bible's been corrupted? And two, if you'd like to add anything to the Matthew 4 breakdown, please go right ahead. Yeah, I don't think it's fair, Brother Nandir, that you mentioned something about a person that he's not here to defend himself. But I'm, I know him personally, and we talk. Um, I don't think he has ever admitted, ever, uh, that the Bible has been corrupt. But you mentioned something earlier, which I love, because by doing so, you're in a way trapping yourself here. In the Quran, chapter 22, verse 52, and we did not send before you any messenger or prophet except that one he spoke or recited, Satan threw into it some misunderstanding, but Allah abolishes that, that which Satan throws in. Then Allah makes precise his verses, and Allah is knowing and wise. Really, what is God going to abolish if it's a fake story, if it's not there? Obviously, it's there. So how can, Satan abol or how can Allah abolish something that Satan threw in? Your own Quran is saying, Satan threw this in. Threw in where? What is he abolishing? Obviously, he's abolishing the verses that came in chapter 53, the satanic verses. And you're saying that God uh, 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 was fooled by Satan. When Jesus was in the wilderness, this is not the God figure. As, uh, as you understand, we believe that Jesus was 100% human and 100% God. How can this 100% God go out there? Well, he's not the 100% God. He humbled himself into humanity and in that human form he went out there but still in that human way he beat Satan while Muhammad was overtaken by Satan let me show you where this is from uh, chapter 15 verse 42 from my slaves the Muslims over them you shaitan have no authority except the lost one who follows you shaitan great we have no authority uh, shaitan has no authority except for those ones that are uh, non-religious, that are disbelievers. Chapter 15, verse 9, Surely we have revealed the Quran, and surely we will preserve it. Chapter 41, verse 42, No falsehood will come to it in the present or in the future. Revelation from one who is wise and praiseworthy. But God will abolish that which Satan threw in. But uh, in the chapters that I just mentioned, 15, 9 and 41, 42, we will preserve it. Uh, no one can alter it. No falsehood will come to it. But then God will abolish that which Satan threw in. How does that make sense? And then Muhammad himself was overtaken by magic. Aisha said there was a man called Laban bin al-Assam from the tribe of Bani Zaraiq who worked magic on Allah's apostle to the point that the messenger was imagining that he had done things that he had not really done. This is what I'm talking about between reality and fantasy. What did he imagine these things that weren't done? Sahih al-Bukhari, book 71, hadith 658. And lastly, finally, uh, the, the prophet thought that he was having sexual relations with his 13 wives at the time when in fact he wasn't. Was he, fantas he was fantasizing. That's what the hadith says. He was fantasizing. It was all in his head. 
Bukhari, book 73, hadith 89. So Satan can overtake Muhammad, the seal of all prophets, by just having a hair that is tossed into a well, and uh, there is black magic there. And the Quran says that shaitan will only overtake those who are, have a disease in heart or who are wrong, who are disbelievers. Obviously, Muhammad fits right in there because your own Quran is going against him. Time has passed. I'm sorry to take yes. so long. Okay, uh, Brother Nadir, uh, obviously take your time to respond to all the, uh, all the comments and the uh, challenges that we made. So uh, basically about the magic spells and, um, you know, we came to challenge Matthew 4 as far as satanic verses. We're not saying that Satan hasn't said anything in the scriptures, but none of the scriptures was under the influence of Satan. So I'm sure, like you said, that was just uh, a light, a light uh, appetizer. So we're ready to hear more from you as far as satanic verses from the Bible. But uh, what do you have to say as far as the magic spells or anything uh, in due regard to the satanic verses? Go right ahead. Sure. Yeah, and if I could just remind the, the group, let's, let's stick with our agreed upon time. I think that was like eight minutes, which you guys took. And at the maximum, we agreed to five minutes each. So let me go ahead and start from the top. Uh, let's first talk about the verse which he quoted in the Quran that about satanic, so, uh, you know, oh, in fact, I forgot the verse you just mentioned. But look, the issue of black magic or magic being affected, this has nothing to do with your verse. This, with a verse. This is your own interpretation that you're spinning upon the text. Once again, what does it prove? Absolutely nothing. In fact, the Quran already refuted this kind of thinking. So basically, in, in fact, let me, let me get there real quick. Inside the Quran, chapter 25, verse 40, 41, it says, when they see you, O Muhammad, they take you not except in ridicule, saying, is this the one whom Allah has sent as a messenger? What? Someone who is influenced by black magic? Ha! Huh. And they got that snotty and snooty little attitude. That proves nothing. Listen, it is God Almighty who chooses what messenger to send, chapter 25, verse 41, as it clearly states, and he is the one who decides what trials and tribulations he would undergo. This has nothing to do with the verse which you quoted. But anyways, let's get back to uh, the other points you were mentioning. You said uh, the issue about, you know, what did God abolish? Please keep in mind the, the, the alleged satanic verses never made its way into the mushaf or what we call the text of the Quran. Again, this is a fabrication, okay? So the whole issue of Muhammad being overtaken by Satan, another fabrication. Remember, Muhammad had no idea what was going on. Uh, again, this goes back to a matter of interpretation. Um, now let's get back to the satanic verses of the Bible. You said, well, really, Jesus was victorious. He said the devil left him and he defeated him and um, beat Satan. All that is good, all that is great. But in my short period of time, I'm going to ask you again the question. When inside Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, it says, And the devil took him to a high mountain. My question to the audience, I'm going to take 30 seconds to answer. Did Jesus go willingly or unwillingly to the high mountain? He went willingly, brother. Willingly. I, I, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Willingly. He went willingly. Willingly. So to obey, so you are now admitting that Jesus obeyed the command of Satan. Are you admitting that? No, no, no. no, no. If, if, I, if I told you to go somewhere, it's not, it's not that you're obeying me. You're, you're willingly to go. You're, you're, you're in agreement that you want to go to a certain place. So that's, okay, that's well, not <laughs> obedience. <laughs> all right, well, let me, let me just answer all this. Did he command it? Brother Satan Nandir, comes uh, up to Brother me, Nandir, did he command it? This is my period of time. Yeah, let me just respond. Yeah, if Satan ahead. comes to me and grabs me and I say, come on, let's go, Nadir, there's going to be a fight to the death. I'm not going to get in the car with Satan. The question here, why wasn't the, you now admitted that Jesus willingly went with Satan? It said that by, again, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. If you don't have the verse, you can just put in Google Matthew 4, 8, and you can read this. These are the satanic verses of Christianity. You have admitted that he willingly went with Satan, and he did ask him. Come, he, he said, to, the Bible says, the, the, the Bible says Satan took him to a high mountain. That's not possible if Jesus was God. That's not possible if Jesus was sinless. Now, you could say that maybe Jesus fell into sin and began and, and was overpowered with Satan. That I accept. So 
the question I'm going to ask you is, how is it that you are now admitted that Jesus willingly obeyed Satan, but yet he's not a sinner? Can you please answer that for me in, in about 30 seconds? The Lord Jesus did not obey Satan. Hebrews 2.14, it says, And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, referring to the Lord Jesus himself, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The Lord Jesus willingly, he became a man, and he went with Satan to prove that he as a man defeated him, and he did not fall for his temptation. Might, might, I add, might I add that he okay, was well, led my, by the Spirit. My, I, let me respond to this. This is my time to talk here. Okay, guys, so you, are, you don't see the fallacy in what you're saying. You, everyone here is admitting that Jesus willingly went with Satan. Okay, so I think what the problem here is, you guys are in denial. Christianity has been debunked. And this story, the satanic verses of Christianity, disproves Jesus as God because God can never go with... There's no way uh, Satan can take God to a high mountain. No way. God's going to fight him and destroy him Just right there. Even a man, yeah. even myself, look at if Satan tries to grab me, it's going to be a big fight. I'm saying, no way. I'm not going anywhere with you. All right? Even if a drug dealer comes up and asks me, or some guy in the middle of the night comes and asks me to get in his car, I'm not going to go with him. But you guys have admitted tonight that Jesus willingly went with Satan, and that is a sin. And we see here that Jesus followed and obeyed the commands of Satan. Okay. So within minutes, Christianity has been debunked and dismissed. Now get back to the whole issue about the Bible. Um, why don't you do this? Why don't you talk to Jay Smith? Because he has made this public in his debate with Shabir Ali. He believes that the Bible is corrupt. So let's do this. In our, go back and ask him. In fact, I'm going to send you a, a video of him admitting that. And then in our next discussion, is Muhammad a prophet? Tell me what he says. But if you don't accept this, and you're not going to graduate from college, you know that? Seriously, because I was a student in, New, in um, religious studies, and it was like the first day of New Testament class. It was actually his first week. The, the teacher said, listen, we don't teach that in this, in this classroom. We teach that the Gospels are anonymous, and they've been changed. We start from this premise. It's okay to have your beliefs. So my point here is that it's not just... Jay Smith, but it's also academia, whether you go to Bradley, the school I went to, you go to Harvard, they're all going to teach from this premise. No one's going to believe in this stuff anymore. It's a myth. And not only that, but I'll give you one more reference. Dr. Daniel Wallace, he's one of your guys. He's the most, probably one of the most prestigious New Testament scholars in the world today. Type Daniel Wallace, Bible corrupt. He goes in great, in great detail on the corruption of the New Testament scripture. What Christians believe now they say the Bible is corrupted, but it doesn't accept doctrine. That's the official position of Christianity. So go ahead and do your homework on that. Um, well, well, so no, brother now, without, now, let me make oh, the last, last, uh, last point here. Uh, and I think I got uh, two more minutes. The satanic uh, is a minute. minute. He's, he's at eight. He's eight. Okay. We'll, get, we'll let you finish up this minute. So take uh, like 30, chapter 40 22, seconds. Verse 50, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, chapter 22, verse 52 is so important here because it says that Allah abolishes what Satan has thrown in. We, and, and we see that there are satanic verses in the Bible, and I will now demonstrate that to you. And my evidence for this is researchers, scholars, and, and historians have researched the Holocaust, and they have made an just an, uh, an amazing find that the Holocaust was actually caused by a verse in the Bible. What my reference is, Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. Go there and visit it. And, and, and I'm going to keep you in suspense over here. And then I'm going to give you a live demonstration of chapter 22, verse 52, how God abolishes the satanic verses. And this is a demonstration I'll do right here uh, on this show. Go ahead, guys. Well, uh, this is very interesting, Nadir. Uh, we need to break down a lot of what you said. So what's funny is you said Jesus went with Satan. And so he already sinned just by going with Satan. Then why did he not bow down to Satan when Satan said, bow down to me? So uh, just can you take 30 seconds, quickly answer, why if Jesus went with Satan and that was sin, why didn't he just full sin on and just bow down to Satan and get the kingdoms of this world? Why didn't he do that? 
Well, that's a, I believe Jimmy Swaggart answered that question. You see, when Jimmy Swaggart was caught with a prostitute, you see, he didn't really physically do any kind of sexual act. He just did some other stuff. Okay. So some people go a little bit, some people go all the way. But the question here is the panel has already admitted that Jesus went willingly with Satan. That was right. Satan's command. Satan took him to the highest mountain. No, that he, wasn't the Satan command. came to Jesus with this, uh, with this command and Jesus followed it. Now, of course, he might have gained strength and then he didn't bow down to him. That's fine. I totally accept that. But there was that moment of weakness. What's he doing in that high mountain? What's Jimmy Swagger doing in that hotel? You see, he's what? not supposed to be there. <laughs> Jimmy, Jesus not, is Jimmy not Swagger. Supposed to be in the high mountain. Jimmy, Jimmy Swagger is not God. We're not. <laughs> we're talking about Jesus. <laughs> but okay, we'll we'll let that go, Nadir. We'll uh, we'll. I just want to let the viewers know uh, the phone lines are now open. You can call in with your questions and comments, and please. We ask that you make it direct, ask one, make one quick comment or one question, and let, uh, let, uh, let us know who you're directing the question to so we can get it answered and get back to the topic. So, geez, there is a lot to say, <laughs> Brother Ismael. Yeah. So besides the satanic verses, uh, the, the supposed satanic verses in the Bible, which I'm still waiting to hear more of them, but um, what, what do you have in response to what Nadir just said? Well, I'm sorry to say this, you know, but Mr. Nadir, he's not uh, being um, academically uh, uh, professional and he's not staying on topic and it's becoming more like a mockery, you know, yeah. to uh, bring uh, James Swaggart here and he's comparing James Swaggart to the Lord Jesus. Um, uh, I, I'm challenging Mr. Nadir and any, any person who's out there uh, give me one sin the Lord Jesus committed. Give me one sin. Isn't there a hadith, uh, refreshed by memory, Adi, that says that all uh, those who come out of their mother's womb, they will be stinked by, by the devil, by Satan, except Isa bin Maryam? So uh, this is with the hadith. This is from the Quran. Okay, and here the Bible. The Bible tells me that when the Lord Jesus, when he became a man, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon Virgin Mary, and the power of God Almighty overshadowed her. Therefore, the Holy One who is born of you is called the Son of God. He was holy from his mother's womb. And he, the, the demons in Mark 1, they said, we know you, you are the Holy One. Uh, did you come before the time to destroy us? So, are you trying to tell me, Satan, who trembled from the Lord Jesus... And uh, when he was casting them out later, uh, he, he, uh, he, he sent uh, because he allowed to be taken by Satan to be tempted and then to reject his temptation and then to tell him, away, away Satan, and then to prove that he defeated Satan as a man and he did not worship him. He was about to give him all the kingdoms of the, of the world. One of the reasons the Lord Jesus became a man there are seven reasons. The, the main one that we all know of, so he can die and then atone for our sins. But then we miss the point that one of the reasons the Lord Jesus became a man, God became a man, so he can defeat Satan as a man. God can defeat Satan with one word, and this is how he's going to throw him into the lake of fire, with one word, and he will throw him into the lake of fire. But he came to defeat him as a man by, this is how it is, not doing Satan's will, not doing his own will, but he came as a man, the Lord Jesus, to do his Father's will. And he succeeded in that uh, wonderfully. He said, uh, who of you will rebuke me of sin? No one was able to rebuke the Lord Jesus of any sin or convict him of any sin. And no one, the Lord Jesus could say, the prince of this world will come and he has nothing in me because the Lord Jesus was true and faithful and came to do the Father's will, not his own will. And he did it to the end. And he's, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he proved that he defeated Satan on the cross by raising himself from the dead. If the Lord Jesus remained today dead, then yes, Satan defeated him. But because he, be, he came out of the tomb victoriously, then he defeated Satan. Okay. Thank you, Brother Ishmael. And uh, before I go to you, Brother Eddie, it is very rich. It is very rich of Nadir to talk about the Holocaust. 
and how we are the one, and the biblically are the reason why the Holocaust happened. When Muslims to this day, like Ahmadinejad and other Muslims, deny that the Holocaust even happened. So I, <laughs> I find it very rich. And then Muslims believe that uh, the end times won't come until they kill all the Jews. So, I mean, <laughs> here we are being the bad Christians trying to get the Jews to believe in Jesus, and Muslims want to kill them. But we'll leave that alone. Uh, go ahead, Brother Eddie, answer, and then we'll, um, we'll get it back to Nubia. Yeah, I see a lot of Muslims do this. They, they go off on tangents. It's a diversion from the truth because you know that the truth has, uh, is getting you caught here. You're, you're caught red-handed. Muhammad is caught red-handed saying that I have fabricated and imputed things to the Lord, to God, that, that have not been there, which I'll mention. The Quran, chapter 19, verse 19, mentions that Jesus was without sin. If he had listened to Satan, he would be a sinner. So your own Quran testifies uh, that Jesus is without sin. That's point number one. Point two, you mentioned Hitler. Hitler actually loved the Muslims because they were shrewd. They were cruel. They took out their enemies by the sword. He loved the Muslims. So if you're going to mention Hitler, find out some, some things about him first. Get educated by uh, that person that you're quoting, at least. And then you're mentioning that uh, he was taken by Satan. Uh, Jesus was taken by Satan. Was he taken by force? Did Jesus ever say, no, I don't want to go? Does it mean if I go willingly, I don't want to go? If I go willingly to my death and knowing my death will save millions of people, and if I go willingly, does that mean I was forced to go? Not really at all. I'm like a hero in these people's faces. And so is Jesus. He's a hero in all of our minds. But let me read to you the history of Al-Tabari, page 108. Okay, that's volume 6, page 108. By the star when it says, your comrade does not err, nor, de nor is he deceived, nor does he speak out of his own desire. And when he came to the words, have you thought upon Allah, Taluza, and Minat, the third and the other, Satan cast on his tongue, again, from history of Al-Tabari, because of his inner debates, and what he desired to bring to his people, the words, these are high-flying cranes, verily their intercession is accepted with approval. This is missing out of the Qur'an, but prior to 1924, this was in the Qur'an, which I'll show you. When Quraysh heard this, they rejoiced and were happy and delighted in the way that Muhammad spoke of their gods, not of one god, of their gods, and they listened to him while the Muslims having complete uh, having complete trust in their prophet in respect of the messages which he brought from God. And he did not suspect him of error, illusion, or mistake. When he came to the prostration, here Muhammad is prostrating, having completed the surah, he prostrated himself and the Muslims did likewise, following their prophet, trusting in the message that they had brought and following his example. Finally, in page 109, brother, I mentioned to you sources, you have mentioned all kinds of things without any sources, which I'm used to Muslims doing, by the way. Those polytheists of the Quraysh and others who were in the mosque clockwise prostrated themselves because of the reference of their gods, which they had heard, so that there was no one in the mosque, believer or unbeliever, who did not prostrate himself. But listen to this. Even the angel Gabriel tells him, Muhammad, quote, Muhammad, what have you done? You have recited to the people that which I did not bring to you from God. And you have said that which has not been said to you. Page 109 of History of Al-Tabari, Volume 6. What do you have to say about that? Here is Muhammad who is being overtaken by the shaitan. He doesn't even know if these words are coming from God. He thought that they were coming from God, but they weren't. History of Al-Tabari is going against you. The, ba the Quran is going against you by Allah saying, I will preserve the Quran, but he is not preserved. And then finally, you keep mentioning Allah will abolish. What will He abolish if it's not these verses? Was He talking about the Bible? No. He's talking about the Quran. I read to you Ibn Kathir. I give you Islamic references. You give us nothing but nonsense that you're saying that there are satanic verses in the Bible. No Christian, no living, biblical, sound Christian will ever believe what you're saying. So don't uh, bring up to us your own thoughts, but bring the thoughts of those that are Christians, true Christians, not Jimmy Swaggart, brother. But uh, before we go uh, to Nadir, we just have a caller, and we're going to take the caller and see what question it is. Okay, uh, Rose? I believe yes, hi. Rose. Yes, hi. Uh, God bless you, Rose. Thank you for coming on Thank Truth you. and Lies. Thank you. Who is your question Thank directed you. to, Rose? It's not really a question, it's just a comment, um, and it's to Mr. Nadir. Okay. Uh, as I'm watching his comments, uh, he said that uh, the Lord Jesus uh, 
followed uh, Satan to the wilderness. I'm sorry, but he's using the wrong words. It's supposed to be actually, and uh, there is nothing to really make fun of or to look with a smile. Mr. Nadir, kindly listen to what I'm saying. I'm not a scholar. I'm just a true Christian. Um, the Lord allowed Satan to take him to the wilderness. He never obeyed him. You have to understand the difference. If you're a real scholar, you have to understand the difference. The Lord Jesus allowed Satan to take him to the wilderness. The Lord Jesus left 40 days and listened me sir please he went for 40 days without any food and he allowed satan to try him on the mountain it's not that the lord jesus followed uh, satan that's not right at all that's one thing the other thing that i want to tell you mr nadir and i love your smile and it looks like you're mocking me sorry i don't like that it's not very nice the law, um, when you said Daniel something, that he said that the Bible's been corrupted. Okay, when people say that Quran's been corrupted from anyone, any name, even a very famous person, would you take that into consideration? Like, please, sir, don't take one person who said something that it is a fact and that we have all to take care of, take, take that into consideration. That's not right. And I don't think as a scholar, this is something it has to be considered. I'm sorry, I'm a very simple person, but I read my Bible. I read it with all my heart. And I know that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the God of God. And no matter how much you try hard to make that the Bible has been corrupted or that we have satanic verses, I'm sorry, sir, just to tell you that the Bible was written by the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. If you okay, thank you, Rose. We appreciate your comment. Uh, we, we need to let Nadir uh, comment on these things. So, um, so uh, Brother Nadir, um, on, okay, hold on. I believe we have another caller. Hello? Hello. Uh, do you hear me, Brother? Yes, we can hear you, Brother. Uh, yeah, oh, Brother, brother Muji. This is Muji from Sweden. How are you? <laughs> How you doing, Brother Moji? I'm fine, thank you. Awesome. And who's uh, your question to, and what would you like to say? Sorry, I don't hear you very well. Oh, I said, who is your question directed to, and what is your question? My question is uh, directed to Brother Eddie, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, it's last yeah, speak, week, uh, speak you, louder, we had uh, Brother Moji. Final, final word in our uh, debate. And he said that it was a, a waste of time, unfortunately. <clears throat> and because I had some uh, technical problems with Skype, so and, uh, I couldn't be concentrated. I just wanted to tell him, Brother Eddie, <clears throat> that um, I converted to Islam uh, because uh, I found Islam as uh, the solution to every single problem we are uh, facing on the planet. And uh, I would uh, willingly uh, convert to Christianity right now, tonight, if uh, he could uh, prove me that uh, Christianity can solve just one of uh, our biggest problems, like drugs, without touching the capitalism. Uh, I would, uh, right now, uh, uh, convert to Christianity because I believe that uh, God sent us prophets and religion to solve our problems. And if Almighty God cannot guide us uh, how to get rid of our problems, uh, for example, the problems of Latin America is not the satanic verses in Quran, uh, and there is uh, the problem is not at all uh, in Islam. And uh, you should uh, come with a solution uh, through Christianity how to solve their problem: drug, prostitution, corruption, uh, <clears throat> all problems that uh, exist in uh, Christianity, uh, Christian world, I, I better say, like in Latin America. Uh, Islam has not touched their, uh, them at all, uh, as, as, I, as I know. So please, uh, if you just tell me how your almighty God, who has cre created the entire universe, can help us to get rid of one problem, just one, because I believe the source of every single problem is 
capitalism and capitalism is Satan because people sell drugs to get money, people sell their body to get money, people rap to get money, everything is connected to money. Yeah. Without that, they cannot produce drugs because it doesn't give them anything. They cannot rob anything because uh, they cannot get money because if money doesn't exist, nobody goes and rob a bank because bank doesn't exist. Bank exists for money. Right, okay. Uh, Brother Muji, uh, okay. we will answer that later because we need Brother Nadir uh, to, we need to respect his time and we need to give him what, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that we want him to address first. So we're going to let Brother Nadir have his time uh, so that he can address all the things that have been, uh, that have been talked about. And then we will get that question answered real quick, Brother Muji, and then we'll go straight back into the topic. So, uh, Brother Nadir, take your time. Um, uh, so, uh, Rose was talking about a couple things as to uh, how Jesus got victorious. Same thing with uh, Brother Ishmael. And uh, Brother Eddie mentioned some sources. And in, in, in general, about textual criticism, we know what Daniel Wallace and Jay Smith do. We just want to know, is that te same textual criticism applied to the Quran? So I just want to let the viewer know we are an hour in. So uh, like I said, feel free to call in at 248-416-1300. But all these are up to you. Uh, Brother Nadir, take your time. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot which was thrown at me. And just to respond to the last caller, I'm not mocking the Bible. I'm not doing mocking anything. I'm naturally a happy person. Okay. Uh, but anyways, let me just get to uh, the points here. Uh, I have to repeat myself. The whole story of the so-called satanic verses, the argument goes nowhere because Muhammad had no intentions of doing this. And the Bible in 1820, Deuteronomy 1820, defends Prophet Muhammad that the prophet who does not speak with zud, with intention, he is the one who's not going to be blamed. Paraphrasing, of course. So the whole story falls, to, I mean, the whole argument fails over here. And so the whole thing about, you know, Muhammad spoke of their gods, it was on his tongue and prostration, none of this matters, it proves nothing. The whole story is, the whole argument, as I said, is it doesn't make any sense. But the challenge was given by Ishmael. He said, give me one sin of Jesus. Yes. Well, the one which about the Lord allowing Satan to take him to a mountain, well, that's a pretty big sin. Uh, and it's a pretty big sin if you do the same thing. So please, don't do what Jesus did over here. If Satan comes to take you, you got to fight, push him away. If you get kidnapped, that's not your fault. But I think you know where I'm coming with that. But let me now fulfill his request. Let's go to um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Jesus says, Whoever shall say, you fool shall be in the danger of hellfire. The word there for fool is moros. I guess we, that's where we get the word moron. I don't know. I'm guessing. But the, but the Greek word there is moros. But then inside Matthew chapter 23, verse 17, Jesus says, You fools, ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. So there you have it. Jesus violates his own commandment. Whoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hell. So very quickly, take 30 seconds, uh, Brother Eddie, and can you please respond to that? Yeah, put everything in context, Brother, when you're reading. When he's talking about you fool, if you say, this, he's talking about the extent of sin that starts within the heart. And then from on the heart, he's even talking about adultery. You've heard it said before that if you commit adultery or if you sleep with another woman who's married, you've committed adultery. But I tell you, if you think about a woman, if you think that's the seriousness of sin, and here you're taking light of it and you're raising up a straw man method, which is pretty ridiculous. But go on, brother. It's your time. What? You're saying if you think about it or something? I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you exactly, that because again? you don't read the Quran, or you don't read the Bible. Jesus said, if you even think of another woman lustfully, you've already committed uh, lustful actions with her in your heart. You've already committed the sin of adultery. That's what Jesus says. But I know that you don't know this because you don't read the Bible. Okay, so you're saying when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 17, you fools, it wasn't done from the heart. Is that what you're saying? Therefore, what I'm okay? saying is Jesus is honing in on the point of sin of sin. 
He compares sin with our actions, but it begins in the mind, it begins in the heart. And that's what Jesus is making a comparison to. Like I said, I know you don't know this because you don't read the Bible. You only like to take verses out of context in order to fill your own ideology so that you can bring them forth on the show or, or to Christians. So you're saying that it was a matter of don't commit the sin when you say you fool? Is that what you're saying? I'm trying to understand this. Look, if I don't know the Bible, I'm learning from you, all right? So explain this again to me. What is it? Whoever shall say thou fool, whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell. And you're saying that if it's something about a sin going on, I don't know what you're talking you about. I mean, murder, explain right? this to me. So explain this. In 30 seconds, please. I got, I got other stuff I got to talk about. Right. Jesus again says, you have heard uh, about the murder. If you go out and you kill somebody in, in hate, that's murder. But I tell you, if you hate your brother or sister, if you hate, you're guilty of murder. He's pointing to the emphasis of sin. He's emphasizing what sin is and where it begins. That's what he's talking about. So you're right. You don't know nothing about the Bible. Let me teach you. I'm glad you're asking a Christian. I wish Muslims would do that more often, but they don't. So let me teach you that he's talking about the sin. He's emphasizing what sin is. Okay, so he's emphasizing here what sin is, that whoever shall say you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. He's emphasizing the sin here. And then he says in Matthew 23, you fool. He just commits the sin he just talked about. Obviously, I'm not getting through to you, but I'm getting through to everyone else. But I, I feel like, you know, you're just playing here. I'm going to take it or okay, give it to Brother right. Ishmael because I don't want to waste your time or mine all because right. I've explained it more than once and it goes from okay. one ear and not the other. Um, okay, let's, let's go Jesus, on. Let's move on here. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, the whole thing about, you know, let, let me just first very quickly, I'm going to give you a live demonstration of, of, of the Quran, chapter 22, verse 52, where it says, and, and Allah abolishes what Satan has thrown in. So I'm going to very quickly uh, share my desktop, if I may, and uh, we're going to go to the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. Now, none of this please keep in mind, is my opinion. This is their research. Yad Vashem is, uh, is, is a Holocaust museum in Israel today. If you do go to Israel, I really encourage you to, uh, to go visit it. So let's just take a look at Yad Vashem. Uh, so they did some research on what caused the, the Holocaust. In fact, can you guys see my desktop? Uh, you guys, can you see my desktop? We can, but it's very small. We have a hard time seeing it. If you could do without sharing it, that would be wonderful, brother. Yeah, maybe I should do that. Okay, oh well. Uh, all right, so let me close that because I know that ruins everything. Let me close my uh, screen share here. Okay, there we go. Uh, can you guys see my, okay, you guys can see my face now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, for those who are at home, just type Y-A-D-V-A-S-H-E-M and responsibility for the Holocaust. This is a huge um, a memorial and museum inside uh, Israel today. Now, this is what they say. This is their official position. Brother Nadir, uh, your, 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 your camera is, is stuck. You're, you're uh, frozen. Your camera is frozen. Um, what we're going to do is give it to Brother Ishmael to answer your question. And then right after, right after, when you get yourself fixed up, uh, we'll come back to you. Go ahead, Brother Ishmael. Thank you. Um, uh, the only person who has the right to address certain people, fools and blind, is God himself. Correct. The Lord Jesus, as God and as the prophet appointed by God to come to his own people, uh, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, and he came, and the soul who did, does not hear to that prophet shall be cut off. And these Pharisees, they did not listen to this prophet, the Lord Jesus. They did not hearken to him. They did not acknowledge him. They did not recognize that he was Jehovah, in their midst and therefore the Lord Jesus is the only one who has the right to address them in such a very uh, strong language he would call them later on broods of vipers, and he would call them hypocrites and uh, and so forth because these people did not repent and the Lord Jesus knew their heart and he knew because he's God that these people have sentenced themselves to complete disobedience and their destiny has been already determined. So he can call them that when he tells them that you are fools and blind. But 
for me to call my brother fool uh, without any uh, reason for it, then the Lord, according to what the Lord said, yes, I deserve hell. But the Lord Jesus, he's the only one who can address certain kind of people with this strong language because he knows them, he knows their heart, rebellious, and their destiny. Okay. So we got you back, Nadir. Uh, we just got a caller in, so we just want to hear what the call is to say, then we'll give you, we give you right back to you. And we haven't answered. Uh, oh, yeah, we Mojis. still have to answer Moji's question, but we'll get to that afterwards. Okay, so caller, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, what is your name, caller? DLT. Neil? Oh, nice to meet you, Neil. DL. DL. I'm sorry, DL. I, I apologize. Okay, uh, DL, who is your question to, and what is your question or comment? It's a comment and a question to Nadir. Nadir, okay. Okay, so Nadir is letting us know that uh, Surah 22, 52 is saying that God will cancel anything that Satan throws in. Um, my, my, uh, my comment is that according to Surah 29, uh, 46, Muslims or Muhammad or Mu and Muslims by extension are commanded to tell the people of the book, that they believe in that which was revealed to them, that which was revealed to us, and their God and our God are one. I guess it's where the, we have the same God. So my question is, is he keeps bringing up Surah 22, 52 as a justification uh, for saying that God will cast out that which, which Satan has thrown in, but if we serve the same God, then I don't know how Satan's word could have got in there in the first place. And I just want to point out that uh, our uh, beloved uh, prophet and apostle John in Revelations chapter 119, after having a vision of the exalted uh, Christ, said uh, Christ told him to write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be and the things which shall be hereafter. Later, in Revelation 10, 1 through 4, the scripture says, and John says, and I saw a strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like the pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open, and he placed his right foot on the sea and his left, and his left on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, and when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunders had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunders have spoken, and do not write them. So here we have two instances in which the prophet is receiving revelations from God. He's told to write, at one point, then at another point, he was getting ready to write, but his God told him not to write these things down. So if according to Surah 4, uh, 2946, the Muslims' Allah is the same as our Yahweh, then how in the world did Satan's word get into the Quran? to the point where Allah would have to remove that which Satan put in. Okay, thank you, Brother Dia. Uh Sorry, Nadir. Um, so we're going to go back to you now that we, you're back up. So make your uh, final comments that you want to make and then answer the question whenever you want to. All right, go right ahead, Nadir. Uh, hold, on. We're not, hold on, we're not getting audio from you, Nadir. Can, can you hear us? Hold on, hold on. We have to make sure we're getting audio. Uh, Nadir? Can you, can you check your mic, Nadir? Uh... Okay, we'll, we'll get back to you. Okay, we'll get back. Uh... Can I throw one more thing about this um, uh, dispute of Matthew 5 and Matthew 23? Yeah, go right yeah, ahead. While he, he gets his fix. Um, uh, I hope he can hear me. Um, in Matthew 5, so the Lord Jesus is addressing someone who is already angry with his brother and out of hatred, and then he calls him a fool. But the Lord Jesus, when he was addressing the Pharisees, he was not, 
he did not hate them, and therefore uh, he addressed them that way. And by the way, in uh, God in the Old Testament, he called the atheist a fool. In Psalms 14, look what the Bible says in Psalms 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And we know who wrote the scriptures, the Holy Spirit. So God is calling an atheist who says in his heart, there is no God. He's calling him a fool. So the Lord Jesus, because he is God, he has all the authority to do that. Just want to throw that in. Okay. Thank you, Brother Ismail. And um, Brother Eddie, we, uh, we just need you to answer Brother Muji's question because he's been, uh, I know he's, he commented he really wants to get the answer as to wh what can, uh, what can um, Jesus do to solve all the problems and then, or one problem as far as money and all that issue. And then we'll get you back to Nadir and get everything resolved. So quickly, Eddie, please. I believe Brother Moses' question was, uh, how can Jesus make the world better? Uh, we understand from uh, uh, Brother Moji that the system is evil here. Satan is evil. But if you look at any uh, Muslim country, Muslim-majority country, there goes the most violence. And this is not my, my words. This is done by Pew Research. You can visit their website. Not only that, the most majority of women that are in the majority Islamic countries, they're the ones suffering the most. Why is that not happening under Christianity? Jesus says, whoever hurts you on the left, turn to him the right cheek. There are about two sword verses in the Bible, and they're talking about justification or protection of you and your family. However, there are about 53 sword verses in the Quran. Read the final marching orders of uh, Muhammad, chapter 9, verse 29 through 32. Fight those who do not believe, not those who are coming against you, not, those, not in, in, in self-defense. Fight those who do not believe in Allah and his final messenger, Muhammad. Please don't attempt to tell me that uh, uh, Christianity is not a religion of peace. It is, and we happen to see that the most, the most atrocities that are done around the world are done by Muslims who are reading passages from the Quran and from the Hadiths. Okay. Uh, so, okay, now uh, back to Nadir. Um, DL's question, like I said, answer that whenever uh, you'd like. But uh, okay. respond to any... Okay, we can hear you, so respond to what... Uh, Take your time to respond to a couple things that we've said as far as follow yeah. up the question, and go ahead. Yeah, let me first correct uh, another fabrication. He said the most violent place in the world are the Islamic countries. Wrong. It's Caracas, Venezuela. It is uh, uh, the New World, which we find in Jamaica. We find inside Mexico. Uh, I would prefer to live oh, in, in the Muslim countries than over there. It is a war zone. Uh, but anyways, like I said, it's Caracas, Venezuela, which is the most violent country. Uh, so that was a fabrication. Uh, you talked about women oppression. This is off topic. You're talking about the jihad verses. Chapter 9, verse 29 is actually my most favorite verses. It is true. You're going to find sword verses of the Quran. But what you're going to find is no innocent people were ever fought. It was only those people who fought against the Muslims, they were fought. But that's a different topic. If you want to debate me on jihad, I would, or I'm sorry, discuss, talk on jihad, I would love to. But let's do that topic for later. Without further ado, I got to continue with my live demonstration of Surah 22, verse 52 of the Quran, how Allah abolishes what Satan has thrown in. Now, let's get back to the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. And I'm going to quote, directly from their website. If you want to follow along, type Yad Vashem in Google, Christianity's responsibility for the Holocaust. And this is their official position. And I'm quoting ad verbatim. There can be no doubt about it. Christianity's anti-Jewish elements provided essential background, preparation, and motivation for the Holocaust that happened when Germans and their collaborators carried out the final solution. Now, at this point, I know what you're thinking. The immediate knee-jerk reaction, it was a misinterpretation or they took scripture out of context. No. They, the Yad Vashem memorial goes on and they say that nevertheless, Christianity, the Shoah, which is the Holocaust, 
is scarcely imaginable because Nazi Germany's targeting cannot be explained apart from the anti-Jewish images of Christ killers. Does that ring a bell? Hello, that's 1 Thessalonians. Ladies and gentlemen, that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, which says, the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus. Let me repeat. The Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophet, and it continues, and they are hostile to everyone. When the Yad Vashem memorial pointed out that this teaching of Christ killers is what created the Holocaust, but not just him. Let me quote to you the Simon Wiesenthal Museum of, Hol of the Holocaust. He was a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust, and he said, referring to this verse, that this, that this teaching, he called it Vatican propaganda, but it's again, it's that Christ-killing verse. He said, let me quote uh, Simon Wiesenthal. It is that resulted in the persecution and murder of the Jews for two millennia. What, Quran, Surah 9, verse 29? Is it, the, is it teaching the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam? Go to the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. And I'll take Eddie there if he's interested. And you will see 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your satanic verse. The, the Yad Vashem Museum and, and Simon Wiesenthal, they're all in unanimous agreement. Christ-killing verse of the Bible is what caused the Holocaust, not the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now let me show you how Allah, now that we've isolated and shown you uh, the satanic verse, which is 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14. Now let's see how Allah abolishes it and throws away the satanic verse. It says inside chapter 4, verse 100, 157, but they did not kill him nor did they crucify him. You see, it nullifies chapter 2, verse 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14 said, gee, the Jews did it. But Allah says in the Quran, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to resemble to them. And those who differ are in doubts about it. They have no knowledge and they follow nothing but conjecture. So here we see chapter 4, verse 157 abolishes the satanic verse of two of first Tim of first Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, which caused the Holocaust. My opinion? No. Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. The mic is yours. All right. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we appreciate oh did uh, I'm not sure if you answered the uh, question, but we can get back to that in a minute. Um, okay. that, I mean, I'm, you, honestly, uh, Nadir, you, you're, really, you're really getting at us. Um, the, the whole Jewish context, I mean, I'm just, I'm just confused because, I mean, we know historically the Muslims tied with the Nazi soldiers. Nazis had Bo uh, Bosnian Muslims fight for him. There were two lines of the SS that were Bosnian Muslims, and they got their or marching orders from Muhammad uh, Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem at the time. And to this day, uh, last I checked, it's Christian nations that support Israel, and it's the Arab Muslim nations that are killing and want to eliminate Israel. So, and then, like I said before, I, I know this is off topic, but Muslims still deny this to this day that there was a genocide that took place called the Holocaust. So I think you're on <laughs> uneasy ground. And I think you're forgetting what Paul said in 1 uh, Thessalonians. You're forgetting Paul is a Jew. The gospel was spread by Jews. Jesus mm -hmm. is a Jew. <laughs> the Germans, Hitler, did not believe in a Jewish Jesus. Neither do KKK or white supremacists. They believe in a Eurocentric Jesus. They don't believe in a Jewish Jesus. So that's completely uh, uh, false and flagrant to say such a thing. But let's put that aside. Let's go to uh, Brother Ismail. Um, yes. Yes. Make any Thank you. Like. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not shocked how uh, Nadir and others, you know, they go and they take a, a, a part of a verse. And by the way, it's not verse 14. Okay. He was mistaken. Okay. It's verse 15. Yeah. Yeah, and you see, the, the problem is they go and they zoom in and they take a word out of its context, then it becomes a pretext. Yeah. Then you can go and you can make whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I, all I want to do just to uh, debunk and just defeat his claims 
uh, that uh, the Christians were behind the, the reason for the Holocaust, which is, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the most uh, insane thing I've ever heard. Just, I wanna, all I'm going to do is just read the text for you from verse 12. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2, um, verse 13, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you, he's talking to the Thessalonians who are Gentiles, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Verse 14, for you, brethren, became imitators. So these brethren are Gentiles, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. So you became imitators of the believers who come from Jewish background. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. You Gentiles, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen, just as the believers from Jewish background suffered from their own countrymen. And then the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men. Paul is not bringing anything new. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 23 that you took a small verse out of it right there, the fool concerning the fool. He was telling the Pharisees, you are the sons of the killers of the prophets. So the Lord Jesus addressed them as the killers of the prophets, and Paul is doing the same thing. He's telling that the Jews, they killed the prophets, and they killed the Lord Jesus when they gave the sentence in the Sanhedrin. He deserves death, and they took him to Pilate. Forbidden us, those Judeans, they're forbidden us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. The text speaks for itself. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ishmael. I just want to let all the viewers know we are in our last 30 minutes, so please call in at 248-416-1300. Comment, share, and like our videos. We want people to... Uh, okay, I believe we have a caller right now, actually, so praise the Lord. Can you hear us, caller? Yes, uh, hello, brother. Brother Moot. Welcome back, brother Moot. Yes, brother. Yes, hi, hi again. I, I uh, hear my voice sufficient? coming back to me. But anyway, uh, brother Eddie um, misunderstood me. He said that uh, I said uh, Bible is violent. No, I didn't say anything about that. I said if uh, your Almighty God can solve one problem of the humanity, we don't talk about Muslim country at all think that they don't exist. We talk about Latin America, okay? They don't, they don't have problems because of Islam. Uh, drugs, prostitution, uh, corruption. If the, uh, the problem with El Pacho, if uh, money didn't exist, El Pacho would never exist, okay? So please tell me uh, your religion's um, solution to one problem of the humanity, Latin America. The drug problem, just one of them, okay? Without touching capitalism, then I would tonight convert to Christianity because I believe the source of every single problem, Islam teaches me, the source of every single problem is one, okay? So if you, uh, your religion, your almighty God that has created the entire universe can help us to get rid of one problem in Latin America, don't talk about uh, Muslim countries. And I can... Uh, have another uh, debate with you if you accept uh, to prove you. If you don't uh, understand it, that's uh, not because it is not the truth, okay? So please just give me one solution uh, to one of our problems, then I will convert to Christianity tonight because I converted to Islam and I can convert to Christianity if Christianity can solve that one problem, drug problem. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Muji. We will get that question answered again. And I'll, I'll personally answer it for you, but we want to take the next caller because, again, we want to give Nadir Ahmed his time. We want to respect him for coming on with us. So, uh, next caller, I believe, Ahmed. Can you hear us, brother? Yes, I can. How are you guys? 
Oh, yeah. praise the Lord. We're wonderful. How about yourself? Um, who is, who, uh, what is your question and comment, and who is it directed to? Um, my question is for uh, Brother Ismail. Is it true in the Bible that uh, Jesus called the Sumerian uh, woman that she came and begged him for bread? He told her he won't be uh, given the bread for dogs or to dogs. That's quoted in the Bible. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad, is, uh, um, all his life, the, probably there is 60 to 65 times they had fight or wars. And most of them are defending their, uh, their Islamic state. Through this time, almost 400 to 450 people are dead in, in all of those fights. If you look at this time, Hitler, uh, Stalin, all these criminals, they killed 50 million, millions of people um, all over the world. So how do you justify that? In the name of Christianity, in the name of the church. When, when the crusaders attacked Jerusalem, took it back, they killed 70,000 Muslims in one day, most of them children and, and kids. How do you, how you justify this? You're going to tell me the church um, apologized for that, but it's too late, my friend. They keep killing Muslims now in Rohingya, in China, in the Middle East. Why we have violence in the Middle East? Because America, because European countries interfering with the Muslim countries. They want to steal their, their wealth, their oil, their money, destroying their countries. That's why we have violence. Uh, and about the women, you're telling me women have rights in Europe and America? The highest rate ratio of women in Germany and Europe from drugs, from uh, all this destruction for families in Europe. Where is the religion? How, how Christian families live in peace in America and, uh, and Europe? Oh, when when the daughter called call 911 on her father and put him in jail. How this is peace? How you justify this? Okay. Th uh, thank you, Brother Ahmed. Uh, so we're going to wait to answer those two questions just because I want to get Nadir to make a couple comments, give him his time. And then, Ismail, I'll let you answer Ahmed's question. I'll answer Muji's question because I don't know why he well, doesn't... Well, the second question of... Uh, okay, so uh, Ahmed's question Ahmed. was... Yeah, no, um, uh, the, I know the uh, Canaanite woman, not the Samaritan woman. Yeah, and the then, Canaanite Yeah, woman. Canaanite. And then the second question... Was it involving how can you justify the multiple killings okay. of Christianity. In the name of Christianity. Yeah, Crusades, okay. yes, yada, yada. Yes. Okay. okay. So, uh, Nadir, Ahmed, it, uh, Nadir Ahmed is to you, brother. Um, uh, again, we want to stay on the topic of the satanic verses and sure, catch sure. up as to far as what you left off at. So go right ahead. Okay. Well, let me respond to the callers. They're actually very right. Let me throw some statistics at you. Seven out of ten children uh, are born from illegitimacy in Jamaica, Christian Jamaica. Two out of three children don't know who their father is. Violence and terrorism and mayhem is rampant all over South America, and Christianity has no answers. And I don't think even the experts who are trying to fix the situation are looking to the Bible. I think it's pretty much agreed. Nobody's going there on both, uh, even uh, on the Christian and the Muslim side. So no, Christianity doesn't have any solutions there. But let's get back to the topic here. Now, Ishmael, I want to take you to task over here, okay? I quoted you, not my words, I quoted you the Yad Vashem, Holocaust Memorial, they said, make no mistake about it, I'm quoting them, it was Christianity, not the teachings of Muhammad. I didn't say Muhammad, teaching of Muhammad, that's my interjection. Let me re re repeat very quickly. Christianity's anti-Jewish elements provided the essential background, preparation, and motivation for the Holocaust to happen. And they quoted, the. they said, what was this propaganda? Christ killer. That's found inside 2 Thessalonians chapter 15. Thank you for that correction. So uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center, I'm, let me give you a quote he said, when Hitler said that he was only putting into effect what the church has always taught, he was quite correct. Hitler was right. And Hitler quoted many passages of the Bible, but that's beside the point. I am quoting you bona fide research of the Holocaust muse museums, which you in ones in Los Angeles, Buenos Aires, and inside Tel Aviv. Are you rejecting their findings? And if you are, what are you basing that off of? Please take 30 seconds so I can finish my point here. Because, my dear friend, 
Romans 13, 1, it says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So first, as Christians, we need to abide by the laws of our countries. Second, the Lord Jesus told us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Three, Acts 1, 8, when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, he told his disciples to go back to Jerusalem, to the same city that killed him. And he said, you, be, you will be my witnesses there in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria to the uttermost of the earth. And when Peter first sermon, when he preached at Pentecost in Jerusalem, he won 3,000 Jews for Christ. The Lord Jesus loves the Jews and the Christians loves the Jews, and we don't want their destruction. We love the Muslims. We love you. We love everyone. We want you to be saved. Thank you. Okay, let me quickly answer that now. So obviously you are rejecting the historians of the Holocaust memorials. Why? Because of your own interpretation of the Bible. And this is what I find so common on these anti-intellectual Christians. They reject science. They reject history. They reject any facts which contradict their dogma. And so I'm not surprised you would say that. But now let me show you how the devil works, okay? And how what you said has no basis in reality. So what basically happened over here, if you read the actual uh, documentation, when the Christians would read this in the Bible and hear this from the sermon, that J Jews killed Jesus, that instilled hatred, rancor, anger, revenge, and spite against the Jews. So yes, telling us pretty rosy things about what the Bible says, and the Bible says everyone loves it, that doesn't do anything. In What happens in reality is what matters, okay? Of course there's, uh, there's rosy teachings in the Gospels. No one's denying that. But what, look what Lucifer is doing here. Lucifer knew that I will put, I will write 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, and the Christian people, that will, the, the, the psychological effect it's going to have on them, it will fill them so full of anger, and that's what caused the Holocaust. But not only that, but as Simon Weisenthal said, 2,000 or two millennia of the murder of the Jews was this Bible verse was responsible for that. So I think this discussion is over. Allah said inside chapter 22, verse 52, that he abolishes what Satan has thrown in. A verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, is from Satan. This is what caused the Holocaust, not my words, but the words of the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial, Simon Weisenthal. And Allah abolishes it with Surah 4, verse 157. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear to them so. And those who disagree, they are in doubt, and they follow nothing but conjecture. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the say how Allah abolishes the satanic verse. And I don't and I think all of humanity will agree with me, except those hardcore. Bible fundamentalists, oh, but the Bible says this and the Bible says that. That doesn't matter. It's what the Bible caused people to do is what matters. And they can't understand this. But all of humanity will agree that a verse which caused the Holocaust, that triggered the Holocaust, is is truly a satanic verse. And that's not found in the Quran. You can go to Yad Vashem. You can go to Simon Weisenthal. It's as if Prophet Muhammad never existed. They don't even care about jihad or all this stuff. <laughs> so I'm th I want to thank everybody uh, for this wonderful opportunity to discuss satanic verses. The mic is yours. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Brother Eddie, I know you've been meaning to talk, and I apologize for not getting back to you in time. So um, I, I think it... <laughs> Again, it's quite interesting how, you know, how it seems to slip in the Muslim mind about the expulsion of Jews in their land when they got Israel in 1948. I think he Nadir, seems to forget about what happened in Medina and the multiple raids on, uh, I forgot, Khaibar or I forgot. Um, Khaibar. Khaibar, uh, exactly, and all the other cities that were <laughs> decimated and Jewish tribes completely destroyed. And again, the genocide, Holocaust denying Muslims that exist to this day. And I just, it, I think it, it's funny, maybe, maybe Jews are just scared to be conflicted with Muslims. But I, please touch on, you know, the, 
not only the satanic verses and whatever other sources, but the type of killings Muslims have indulged in in the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, the seventh century up until the 21st. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will mention my favorite, which is Um Qurfa, and I believe that uh, a lot of people don't know about her. But let's, let's answer Moji's question no. as well, because okay. I, I want you to convert tonight. You <laughs> promised me you're going to convert. But first, I've never heard a, a carpet bombing of, of uh, errors taking place. Brother Nadir, you have topped it. I mean, I've heard a lot of Muslims make mistakes, but you, however, are firm in your errors. And then you accuse us of being anti-intellectuals. But that's okay. Ed Hanerman, I won't do that. I'm not attacking you. I want to go back and answer Brother Moji's question. Uh, what is the problem with the world? The problem with the world is sin. The first act of murder in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Cain is talking, I mean, uh, God is talking to Cain before he commits the act of murder. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. No one can rule over it. Hence the reason why Jesus came. Because if we can't rule over it and we can't do it by ourselves, Jesus says this is impossible with man, but it is possible with God. And that's from Jesus. Jesus is referring to himself. So if you're saying that there is a, a solution here and you're looking for a solution by man, it's not going to happen. The solution is Jesus Christ and only by him because his rules, his rules are the ones that make humanity better. The church, Christianity, has suffered ever since day one. And guess what? Through the suffering, it grows more and more. Now, back to uh, uh, Brother Nadir. Uh, he's saying that this abolishment takes place. You still have not answered my question. As of, of all the questions, I keep quoting your sources in context. But you're not doing the same now. You've got to play fair. You've got to play ball fairly. So I'm going to your histories of Al-Tabaris and all of that, and you're not mentioning anything. I'm going to your Sahihs, and you're mentioning Hitler and, and what it says of the museum. Brother, whoever claims to be a Christian and is not doing Christian things is not a Christian. I can have a label on this bottle that's completely empty, says Christian, but nothing's on the inside. They're completely empty. So when a Christian says that they're a Christian and they're doing things that are not Christian-like, they're not Christians. However, when Muslims are doing things in the name of Islam, and I go back to the Quran and I find out this is true. They're actually following the Islamic sources. They're actually following what Muhammad did to Um Qurfa, an older lady, an older lady who was in charge of a, a tribe, pagan, but so what? They weren't doing anything wrong to Muhammad or his tribe. Muhammad had, was the uppermost during that time. He goes there, he ties a camel or a horse to each one of her legs and spreads her apart evenly. Then he takes her daughter and he sells her daughter or gives the daughter in a, as a wedding gift to his uncle and she bores him a son. What kind of a prophet is that? You want me to follow that prophet? And then you're saying that these are satanic verses that are being abolished. What is being abolished? What is being abolished? Why did God not come before and abolish it? And let me ask you this. Why did God even have to say, I will abolish what Satan had put in? Why not just not say anything about it and abolish it altogether? Why put it in? Because it's not God talking. This is a figment of Muhammad's imagination of the rock God, Allah, that is belonging to the pagan Arabs before. Now let me read to you this that you have not addressed, which I really need you to address, please. In the history of al Tabri. Volume 6, page 108 and 109, when Gabriel came to Muhammad, Muhammad said, I did not bring these two. In page 108, then the messenger of Muhammad said, I have fabricated things against God and have imbued it to him, words that were not spoken of him. History of Tabari, volume 6, page 108. Please look it up. So Muhammad here, he blames these satanic verses on Satan. Finally, one last point. In chapter 22, verse 52, I'd like to read the verse and the next verse. And we did not send before you any messenger or prophet, except that when he spoke for recited or recited, Satan threw into it some misunderstanding, but Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in. And then Allah makes precise verses and Allah is all-knowing. But here, this is, this is the kicker. That is, so he may make what Satan throws in as a trial for those within whose hearts is disease. So not only does God abolish it or is, is talking about Satan, but he's telling you the reason why he's abolishing it. What is he abolishing? Something that was thrown into who? 
to Muhammad, to the people of Muhammad, so that he may make what Satan throws in a trial for those within whose heart is disease and those are heart of hearts. And indeed the wrongdoers are in extreme dissension. So who is it about? Why didn't God bring this source out later during the time of Jesus? And then you're, you're accusing satanic verses of being in the, in the Bible. Show me one scholar, one Christian, biblically sound scholar that says the same thing as you do. While I'm showing you all your scholars, you're not doing me that same favor. So please stop talking about errors upon errors upon errors. And these are just silly things. I feel like you're wasting your time talking. Please get to the nitty gritty of the situation, of the topic at hand, and mention some sources. Okay. Um, we're going to go to Brother Ishmael. I know we need to answer Ahmed's questions, so I'll let you answer that, and then we'll go back to Nadir for okay. the last comments. Thank you. Yeah. And also, uh, Mr. Nadir, he came back to me. Uh, let me tell you one thing uh, concerning the First Thessalonians 1.15. Uh, let me tell you who really killed the Lord Jesus. First, no one could have touched the Lord Jesus John 10, 17, 18, he says, I have the authority to lay down my human soul, and I have the authority to take it back, receive it back again. The Lord Jesus, he humbled himself, and he allowed himself to be taken to be crucified. If he didn't do that, no one would have ever been saved. And by the way, you know who was there to, you know who put the Lord Jesus on the cross? It was my sins and your sins. The Lord Jesus, out of love for you and for me, he took our sins on the cross. He took my place. He took my sins. And he took my judgment that I was supposed to receive for my sins. And he paid the price fully when he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. Now, going back to Mr. Ahmad. Mr. Ahmad, I uh, thank you for calling. Thank you for the question you addressed me. And I would like to advise you, my dear friend. I was with you. I was like you once upon a time. And I read the Bible clearly and honestly and the Lord showed himself to me. What I would advise is if you can read, take the Bible and read it for yourself, my friend. First, it wasn't the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman is in John 4. This was the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. And if you would just read the passage, just read the passage. I don't have to do any comment. Just read the passage and it will answer for itself. It's found in Matthew 15, 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, that's in Lebanon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cry, cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Throughout these verses, I did not stop to comment. She addressed him as Lord, confessing he is God. She had the, the, the uh, conviction that only him can cast out demons. And no one can cast out demons only if he is stronger than demons. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, I'm going to continue reading. She had no problem with it. You have a problem with it. Millions of Muslims have a problem with it. She, the one that you think she was insulted, had no problem with it. She said, and she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. My dear friend, the, Muslim, the, the Jews, they looked at the Gentiles as dogs, unclean, because the dogs are unclean animals. Gentiles did things horribly. And when they worship idols, they committed adultery, they ate the pigs and, and they drank the blood and all of that. So they looked at him and they called him dogs. 
And the Lord Jesus, as a Jew, he is a Jewish, and he talks to the culture, the Jewish culture. And he told, you know, I cannot take the bread for the children and give it to the dogs. The children here are the Jews. The dogs are the Gentiles. And he said, I cannot do that. I came for the lost ch uh, children of Israel. She said, yes, yes, I agree. I am from the Gentiles, but it is written in the Old Testament, and the Gentiles, they can eat from the crumbs that falls from the, the children's table. And then he told her, great is your faith. Let it be done. What is it you need? So here she admitted that she was a Gentile. And I want to say something to, to, uh, to the uh, uh, Ahmed's second question concerning the Christians and the killing of others and the massacres that took place in the uh, 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 Crusades. Thank you. Uh, I want to refer you to what happened when they came to capture the Lord Jesus. And Peter, one of his disciples, took a sword and he cut off the ear of the high priest's uh, bondservant, Malchus. What, the, what did the Lord say? He said, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword, they will die by the sword also. Put it away. I did not come to destroy. I did not come to kill people. I did not come to kill by the sword. I have come to win people's hearts through their minds with love. Napoleon Bonaparte said, I and Charlemagne and Caesar, we have established our emperors, our kingdoms by the power of the sword. But Jesus of Nazareth has established his kingdom by the power of love. Show me from the, from the New Testament where the Lord Jesus said, take a sword and go kill the infidels. You will not find that. And finally, I want to say to Moji, you know, Christianity is not a religion, my friend. Christianity is... Uh, it's not a religion you enter into, you convert into a religion. Christianity is a person who enters your heart. His name is the Lord Jesus. He promises when he comes into your heart, when you allow him to come into your heart, he will save, save you, he will forgive your sins, he will give you peace, he will give you joy, he will give you meaning for life, and he will assure your destiny, and he will make you a useful person. He did that to me 26 years ago, and he can do it to you and to all the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ishmael. Okay, um, so we're in our last, uh, last I believe, uh, 10 minutes or so. So we just want to let the callers know if you want to make a last-minute call or question, or, I'm sorry, comment or question, feel free to call in at 248-416-1300. So now we're going to give the floor to you, Brother Nadir, for your last, um, your last uh, comments or your last points about the Satanic Verses or any other topic. Uh, we would prefer the Satanic Verses, but uh, just uh, what your, your last comments for the viewers, what they should know, and uh, maybe just how to reach you you know, for further discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I want to first thank everybody for this wonderful discussion. Are we still on for Is Muhammad Prophesies in the Bible, Deuteronomy 18.18? 18? Are yeah, you still good talk, with that? Yeah, we'll, okay, we'll do that next month. And we'll plan that okay. in 2019 for sure. Sure. So the satanic versus argument is actually an argument which goes nowhere when it comes to Islam because Muhammad had no intent of saying those, and God never asked him to repent, never reprimanded him. Uh, rather, he consoled Muhammad when this thing happened. You keep quoting Tabari, but that is a commentary written, I don't know, like 600 years after Muhammad died. But the book you should be quoting is Ibn Ishaq because it's found in there. Quote primary sources, please. So Tabari, uh, once again, is an argument which, which really shouldn't be even quoting that book. Go straight to the sources. Um, um Kurfa, way off topic. Uh, when we discuss jihad, I will address and uh, and answer that. These are the whole thing about, you know, I think the main point here tonight is the satanic verses, when it when we look at Christianity, it debunks Christianity. Jesus, the Bible says inside Matthew 4, to, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, and Satan took him to a high mountain. The, the, the panel here said Jesus went with him willingly. That's following the commands of Satan. Satan took him. But what should have happened, if Satan tried to grab me, there would have been a big fight to the death. But that didn't happen. So the satanic verses of Christianity debunk and dismiss Christianity as a myth. But it doesn't end over there. God said inside chapter 22, verse 52, that he abolishes what Satan throws in. And we did find a satanic verse in the Bible. Says who? Me? No, don't follow me. I'm the last person you want to listen to. Follow Yad Vashem, Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. 
follow um, Simon Weisenthal Center which, uh, for Holocaust Remembrance inside Los Angeles and others in them. They're all unanimous. It was the, the verse which taught Christ, I'm sorry, that Jews killed Christ is the what instigated and, and fed the Holocaust. They said, make no mistake about it. And we are not going to make any mistake about it, Mr. Ishmael. Your rosy interpretations don't fix the problem here. It's just an interpretation. Other Christians are going to spin other interpretations. And the problem is you can't see these are things open for interpretation. But they went in great detail in their research. And you ask, what about Christians who have acknowledged this? Presbyterian Mission, they have acknowledged it. Christianity Today, they have acknowledged it. And other than them, to find my sources, Type Christianity's responsibility for the Holocaust, Yad Vashem, Simon Weisenthal, and you'll get all my reference. And I thought the most spectacular part of tonight's debate or discussion, really, is how the truth of, 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 of how what Allah said, that he abolishes and throws out what Satan has did or has thrown in. And he did that with chapter 4, verse 157. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, throwing out the satanic corruption of First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, which caused 6 million Jews to be incinerated in the, in the Holocaust. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Brother Nadir. Thank you for coming with us, and we will definitely have you on for more shows. Uh, yes, uh, just want to make a quick comment in regards to the Holocaust. I just want to let you know Christians also died in the Holocaust alongside Jews. Sure. And G there are Jewish believers in Jesus the Christ. And I don't think they hate Jews that don't believe in Jesus. So we'll leave that alone. Thank you again for joining us in this discussion about the satanic verses, whether it's true or not. I'm going to let Eddie and Ishmael uh, wrap up with their final comments. I just want to really touch on Muji's question just one last, I want to piggyback off what you guys said. Brother Muji, the Lord Jesus said one thing that I think is going to stick out to you. He said, a man cannot serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other, devote to one and despise the other. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon or wealth. So what you're saying is you see clearly there are a lot of people who serve wealth, whether it be prostitution, robbery, drug trades. You understand that. We understand that. And people who serve God that will never compromise their values to get money in this manner. So what we're trying to tell you, just like Ismail and Eddie told you, the solution is Christ. Christ will get you to follow God. Because Jesus says, if you have love for me, you have love for the Father. And the Father loves you if you love me because me and my Father are one. So to know that you are actually following the right God is if you follow whom he has sent, which is Jesus. In Hebrews 1, to go against Nadir, it says, in past, in past, in decades, or past centuries, in the past, God spoke through the prophets. But now he has spoken through his Son. Meaning, there is a progression. It was leading up to the Son. So we didn't need another prophet to reveal anything that the Son hasn't already revealed to us. So back to uh, Brother Moji. What we're trying to tell you, Brother Moji, is in the Quran... There's verses on splitting booty with Muhammad. Literally, Quranic verses about how to split up war booty with Muhammad. This, if it's in the eternal word of God, it, it has no relevance to today because Muhammad isn't alive for you to give him portion of your war gatherings or war um, money. So, a religion that promotes giving your money to Muhammad and giving your money to fund terrorism, as opposed to Christianity, which is trying to tell you money. He, Jesus says, do not build your treasures in earth, build them in heaven. We're trying to tell you that if you really want the solution, trust in Christ. There'll still be devils, there'll still be evil people on earth that are going to do wrong, but the solution starts with individuals in the heart. Okay, so that, we'll leave that alone. I hope Brother Muji does convert. That'd be amazing, and we'd love to have him on as a Christian. But Brother Eddie, your final comments, and Brother Ishmael, your final comments, and we'll wrap up the show. Sure, sure. So thank you for coming on, Brother Nadir, if you're still on. Uh, iron sharpens iron, so I appreciate that. 
uh, please, I look forward to doing more shows with you. However, you quoted some things. You said, uh, I, I'm, question, I'm uh, mentioning Al-Tabari. However, you just quoted Al-Tabari yourself to prove your point. I not only mentioned Al-Tabari, I mentioned Ibn Kathir. I mentioned Sahih al-Bukhari. I mentioned your earliest, earliest sources for points that work against you in the satanic verses. That's one. Two, you're making something that really hurts Islam into nothing. This is the straw man method here. What are, you, what are you doing? How come you're doing that? Because this really hurts Islam. I gave you the Ibn Kathir's tafsir, how he admitted that Muhammad bowed down to these pagan goddesses, therefore making him a pagan himself. But you don't buy that because you're only picking and choosing from verses. You say, uh, chapter 4, verse 157. That's the only verse in the Quran that says that Jesus did, was not crucified. However, that's been plagiarized from the Gospel of Basilides, which is in 2nd century, written in 2nd century, found in the later 6th century, around the same time that Muhammad was beginning to be famous here. Okay? And your own Quran is going against you. Read chapter 3, verse 55. Chapter 3, verse 55, God says... I will kill you to Jesus. I will cause you to be dead. So chapter 4 verse 157 is going against chapter 3 verse 55 in your own Quran. And Allah says, O oh Jesus, indeed, I will take you. That word, I will take you. If you read Arabic, I will cause you to be dead. The word there is mutawafika. That means I will kill you, cause you to be dead. Not breathing at all. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, brother... With, with mentioning all these sources that you looked over and, and not even paid any attention to, I'm really reaching out to you with this one. In the Quran, chapter 69, verses 44 to 46, God promises, God promises, if Muhammad had made up some of these false sayings, we would have him seized by the right hand and we would have cut off his life artery, particularly uh, aorta. I think it's mutawain. Uh, the, the word in Arabic. I have not had it here. I'm not reading it in the Arabic. Now, how is he going to kill him if he has fabricated things? By cutting off his iota. Okay, narrated Aisha, the prophet in his ailment in which he died, used to say, Oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Khaybar. And at this time, I feel as if my iota is being cut from that poison, Sahih al-Bukhari, book 5, Volume 59, 713. What are you going to say now? I'm mentioning all your sources. You're mentioning something that took place, what, 1,400 years later? What are, you, what are you talking about? You're talking about the Holocaust? And then you're trying to say that these people that did the Holocaust and the Crusades are Christians? No way. No Christian would say that. Look at their actions. Their actions are speaking against Christianity. If that happens, they're not a Christian. But if when I see a Muslim and their actions... People say are speaking against the Quran, not really, speaking just exactly as the Quran is telling you. Read chapter 9, particularly verse 5, 929 that you mentioned. What else do you have to say since I'm mentioning your own sources? Unfortunately, we're not, we, we, we ran out of time, but I, I really want to do this with you again. I've enjoyed our time together. Awesome. Thank you, Brother Eddie, for the final comments. Uh, Ismail, one thing you'd like to say to the viewers before we uh, depart from the show? Thank you. Uh, as to these satanic verses, uh, Mr. Nadir kept on saying that it doesn't make any difference and there's no case for it for Islam. Then my question to him, then why was the blood of uh, Salman Rushdie in the 70s yes. of last century, was, uh, there was a fatwa to kill him? Why? Uh, and these were scholars that they did this. Um, uh, as to the, um, the temptation of the Lord Jesus, um, I wrote this and I want to read it to you. The main object of Satan throughout the threefold temptation was to induce Christ to act from himself, okay, independent of his Father. And that's what the core of sin is, to be independent from God and to act independently. And he failed. He failed bitter bitterly. And the Lord Jesus was victorious. And he did not do his own will, but he kept on you know, faithful to do his father's will. And to the end, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that was how the Lord Jesus was victorious over, 
over Satan. The third thing I would like to bring as to you kept on uh, going to 1 Thessalonians 2.15 concerning the Jews uh, killed the Lord Jesus and that stirred up the Holocaust. And you were quoting someone we never heard of, millions of people never heard of. Uh, let me tell you one thing. Uh, when when they, um, the Jews, the, 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 the unbelieving Jews, they hate the Lord Jesus. They don't call him by his name, Yeshua. They call him by a, a mockery name, a, a blasphemy name, yeah. just for you to know. So they can make up any story. If they killed him, the high priest, they turn him over to Pilate, they hated him and they killed him. So do you think their offspring, offsprings will be any better, those who do not believe? And let me tell you one thing. What, they, what happened in the Holocaust was a harvest for what they have sown in the cross. They told Pilate, they told him, his blood is upon us and upon our children for generation and generation. And that is what has taken place. And still more, they will give more in the seven years of tribulation for what they did to the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus, he allowed himself into the temptation. The Lord Jesus was not behind the Holocaust. And the last thing I would like to say, all my dear uh, viewers out there, the Lord Jesus came to this world not to destroy people, not to condemn people, not to do his own will. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself a ransom for money. And finally, he could say, the thief does not come, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Come to Christ. Come now. And you will not regret it. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ishmael. That was wonderful. Thank you, Brother Eddie. Thank you, Brother Nadir. We appreciate all the conversation, and we love the discussions we have because, like I said, where the show Truth and Lies, we examine the truth and expose the lies. So we're excited to have you. So always stay tuned every Friday, 9 p.m. to 11. We have great topics and great speakers. And like I said, we are live on Facebook, but we want you to comment, share, and like so everyone can see this episode and more episodes to come. So God bless all the viewers, and we'll see you next week.